Hi, my name is Chad Bogart and I serve as the Museum Curatorial Assistant at Sycamore Shoal State Historic Park in Elizabethton, Tennessee. And today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, music uh, in colonial America. Um, music was such a major part of life uh, for folks who lived 250 years ago just as it is today. Um, people used music as a pastime to uh, to enjoy after the hard work had been done out in the out in the fields, and so we're going to share some uh, some instruments and music that you might have heard um, back in the colonial days. Now, probably the oldest uh, musical instrument known to man is probably the drum. Um, drums, uh, evidence of drums have been found going back tens of thousands of years. But, probably the oldest stringed type of instrument is what today we refer to as the mouth bow. And these have been found, the paintings of these have been found on, on caves in France that date back about 15,000 years. Um, and all it consists of is simply a stick and a string. And Today we use a, a pick, which we would call a plectrum. Uh, back then they might have used a, a stick or a bone or even perhaps a fingernail to uh, pluck the string. Um, but you pluck the string with the pick and it vibrates the string. That doesn't sound too impressive right there. But it's called a mouth bow because you use your mouth as the resonator. Uh, just like the box on a guitar amplifies the sound, we're going to use our mouth to amplify the sound of the mouth bow. So you pluck the string, the string vibrates, the vibration is transferred to the wood, you place the wood up on your jawbone and it transfers the vibration to your jawbone and so it vibrates your head, it encircles your head, your hair stands on end, your eyes shake around, you open your mouth and the sound comes out. And the more empty your head is, the better it sounds. So, you'll get to see how empty my head is. Lay down, boys, and take a little nap. We're all going down to the Cumberland Gap. Cumberland Gap, Cumberland Gap, 25 miles to the Cumberland Gap. Cumberland Gap is an old place, three kinds of water to wash your face. Daniel Boone on the pinnacle rock, killed him and any with an old flint lock. Me and my wife and my wife's pappy walked all the way to the Cumberland Gap. Gonna take my money and buy me a farm, gonna raise sweet taters as long as my arm. So lay down, boys, and take a little nap. We're all going down to the Cumberland Gap. Cumberland Gap, Cumberland Gap, 25 miles to the Cumberland Gap. So there you see, empty head, right? All right, so that's the Cumberland Gap on the mouth bow. Moving along to an instrument that uh, also uses your mouth as the resonator is the jaw harp, or the mouth harp, or the juice harp, or the Jews harp. Many names for these. Um, some uh, historians have said these were called Jews harps because uh, it may have reminded somebody of uh, the scriptures that talk about the harp of David in the Psalms. Um, but, uh, but this was a very, very uh, common musical instrument, especially on the frontier. And in many archaeological sites, you'll see uh, jaw harps uh, in, in the archaeological record. Um, so, like the mouth bow, it uses your mouth to transfer the vibration out so you can hear it. But <clears throat> this has a metal bar that vibrates rather than a string. And so you place this up to your mouth and rest it on your teeth. And to get the sound, you pluck the, uh, the bar. 
And to get those different sounds, just like when you whistle, you make the cavity of your mouth small or large to get different pitches. And so uh, that's how you get the different sounds with the jaw harp. Now you can open up your throat and breathe while you play and you get all kinds of weird sounds. So there's the jaw harp. And this was small, it could fit into a pocket, easily uh, transferred around, easily carried around. And so this would have made its way onto the frontier very fast. Uh, when the settlers uh, started coming into this part of the country. Um, we have different sizes. Larger ones make deep sound. And smaller ones make more high-pitched sounds. So, many different jaw harps. Another small musical instrument that could be carried around in your pocket uh, are bones. And these come from the ribs, uh, usually of pigs. Um, these were also carved out of uh, whale bone, whale ivory, and the cabin boy on board sailing ships um, usually knew how to play some type of musical instrument, be it the bones or a tambourine or a drum. And they would play music as the sailors worked on board the ship because work on board ship can get very monotonous hauling lines and swabbing the deck and cleaning the boards and all that can get very, very boring. And so the cabin boy would be, uh, one of his jobs would be to play music for the sailors to uh, give them a cadence to work to and also get their mind off of the hard work. Uh, but the bones, these are rib bones, and if you place them opposing one another where they kind of rock back and forth, and you hold them in your hand a certain way where one stays still and the other one is allowed to flop back and forth. Uh, and the way you twist your wrist, you get the clicking sound. And so this is a percussion style instrument um, that uh, can easily you know, be accompanied by the voice uh, for, for providing music uh, just about anywhere. So. Now those are actual bones, made out of bone. Bones can also be made out of wood, and it gives you a different sound. So these are made out of maple. So you can see the different tone that uh, different materials might, uh, might give on the bones. Um, moving on to uh, wind-type instruments, here in the Appalachian region of, of the United States, we have a huge influx of uh, culture from the British Isles. Um, most of the people who settled here in the 18th century were, were either of Scottish, Irish, uh, or English descent. Um, and they brought their particular type of uh, music with them. And one of those instruments would have been uh, the tin whistle. Or, or the penny whistle, as it's sometimes called. It's called a tin whistle because it's made out of the metal tin, um, and it uh, would be very inexpensive, so just about anybody could afford one of these. It's also called uh, a penny whistle because it costed about a penny to, to buy one. Again, very inexpensive, um, and, and thus more people could, could own them. And, uh, and again, it's small as well, just like the other instruments we've shown you, uh, and it could be easily packed away and, and brought, brought with you. Um, but I'm going to play <clears throat> a tune here on the, on the penny whistle or the tin whistle um, and hopefully you'll hear that, that Scots-Irish sound. called The Girl I Left Behind Me, and it was a popular tune back in that time period during the, uh, the colonial era, the Revolutionary War era, 
uh, because it reminded the, the soldiers of the girl they left behind to go fight, perhaps their wife or their sweetheart. So that's the girl I left behind me on the tin whistle. There are also penny whistles that are made out of wood. And um, it's amazing how the same instrument, um, even when it's made out of a different material, imparts a different sound to it. So this wooden penny whistle is a lot more mellow than the tinny sound of the tin whistle. So here's the wooden penny whistle. first installment of these videos. Join us again for the second installment and we'll play some stringed instruments for you. <laughs>